Okay, let me just make an announcement about this progress report meetings. Well, we were supposed to have the meeting last week. And um, on Tuesdays, my sort of uh, lunch break time is being occupied by this talk show, which I attend um, from 1 to 1.30 p.m. on commenting on Turkish foreign policy issues as the guest of honor of uh, Ms. Günhan Gönül. She is a, a faculty of law student. This year she is graduating. And when she came to me just two years ago, when she was a sophomore student, she wanted to uh, continue this program, which I had started myself upon the insistent re uh, request coming from students, probably in 2002 or 2003. Since then, I continued with some of my students. Um, and now, some of them are doing quite serious things in TV channels, Bushra and Gülşen from CNN Turk, Ayşen from TRT, and a couple of others. So, uh, I, I mean, whenever you have time, if, if you're driving, drive safely first, but then if you want to tune on to Bilkan Radio, you can listen to me if you want to do so. I mean, um, from 1 to 1.30. Um, that said, I will have this progress report meetings with, with teams tomorrow from noon to 1.30, that is uh, lunchtime, well, on a first come, first serve basis. I don't think I should make appointments which may not fit your schedules. So if you just stop by my office, of course, all members of the team should be present. This is the ideal situation. If for some reason some of you may uh, may not show up, that might be understandable, provided that you have a very good excuse. But other than that, please come up, uh, come to my office from any time from noon to 1.30 p.m. Um, if you like, I can give you specific time slots where you should come, but as I said, and as we have seen in the previous attempt, this may, these, these time segments may not fit your individual schedule. So whenever you can, on Tuesday, sorry, on Wednesday and Thursday, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, you're welcome to come to my office. Actually, you are kindly required to come to my office, but the time of your coming, it's up to you. And of course, uh, because there is no specific schedule for this meeting, I mean, any time slots, any time segments, you may have to wait, of course, quietly, because my door is always open, and when I speak with a group, and if you speak outside the office, we cannot hear each other, right? So please keep quiet and wait. And if you see a lot of people, you may just take your time to take a walk and make another round. And if it's free, just jump in, all right? So make your friends know about this progress report meetings on Wednesday and Thursday, this time in my office. And the choice of time is up to you. Just you determine, and of course, if you like, you can just, uh, as I said, wait in the queue. I don't think it's going to be a long one. Or you can just come in time which uh, fits your individual schedules. Um, about the exam next week, I know this is a question always on your mind. Always you want to learn as to what kind of uh, exam it's going to be. My former students know me very well, uh, that I'm not asking any sort of multiple choice or fill in the blanks type, you know, primary school type of examinations. I'm, I'm going to give you a, an A4 size paper. There will be just one single sheet of paper. It's going to be, I think I may give you two groups of uh, questions. One on this side, you may have to choose among possibly two or maybe three questions. Just pick one. I had some students who answered all the questions. Well, <laughs> well 
sweating and trying to catch up with time. Anyway, um, and then you write the answer for that particle question on that si side of paper. And you just write from left to right, not upwards or downwards. And do not write in a microscopic manner. I cannot read. Thanks to you, I now have glasses to read. <laughs> so, and therefore, uh, you will be required to answer that particle question, just any one that you pick um, here. And then you turn the page, and don't ask me which one you should start with, right? Whichever you start. I mean, these are questions I keep getting. Don't laugh, but this, this is serious. So, um, therefore, there will be possibly several questions out of which you will pick for one particular group, just one of them. You cannot choose two of them and skip the other two. You have to choose just one from here and one from here. And then that's it. This is, this is going to be your answer paper, answer sheet, all right? So therefore, use clearly, uh, write legibly, so that I can read what you write there. And I, unless I, I read it, I cannot grade you, of course. So um, this, because you will have one almost full size sort of a side of paper, then, well, it's not going to be a very short essay. It's not going to be an essay. It's going to be something in between. So, and if you know the subject well, this much is even more than enough. No one will be able to complain, well, you know, I knew that much and so much, but there was not enough space to answer fully. No. And uh, just uh, trust me, if you show me by way of, you know, explaining the situation by way of writing, if you show me that you study it, that you know the subject, even if you reflect 70, 80 percent of what you have on mind, uh, just uh, you, you can get full credit. Don't worry about. It. Don't worry about grades, provided that you uh, study enough, right? And the more you respect this course, not only myself, the more this course will respect you back. So, meaning, reading the papers, chapters that are left to reserve on a timely basis. All right. Okay. So, uh, I hope there will be no other questions about exams or this. Uh, um, progress support meetings, which I get uh, during the break. So the threat perception, threat perception thing is important. The national threat perceptions. When we talk about the Middle East, of course, Egypt is one major country that we talk uh, almost extensively about the economic situation, political situation, military situation, and uh, the geographical, historical situation. Yes, but there are still things to say. For instance, the mindset of the Egyptian elite has always been preoccupied with what happened in history. Because of the geographical location that it occupies, Egypt almost throughout history under occupation. So that was something that has also created some sort of a psyche, uh, uh, again, um, in the minds of these people that they, had, they, they started to interpret all sorts of developments, primarily filtering through this psyche. I mean, is this going to pave the way to another, yet another occupation? Because they have been occupied by almost all the great powers of their periods in, in history. So uh, the, starting from the Romans and even before up until the Ottomans. So, and then, of course, the Brits, I mean, who... Uh, uh, from whom they won their independence later on. So this is something that has an impact. Again, uh, the, the way they, they interpret history has a lot to do with how they perceive threat or, and how they devise their foreign policy. The, we talk about a, a economic situation, how they uh, interpreted the developments, and what was important for them. Of course, with respect to the political situation, the domestic situation, being the uh, a birthplace of Muslim uh, Brotherhood, today, even at present day, Egypt, Egyptian security elite, the decision-making elite, the administrative elite, they are very much preoccupied with the threat posed by Muslim uh, Brotherhood and the uh, religious fundamentalism. This is not something that they cannot just pay any attention. They do pay attention 
to what is happening. Of course, meter issues are maybe primary of, uh, are of primary significance for any particular country. It is, of course, um, also of very great significance for Egypt. But as I said, some economic issues, some uh, political issues, geographical issues, as we talk about the Nile he here, uh, may have, uh, if not more, but equally important uh, issues for Egypt as they are for uh, the, the, the threats that they perceive from the military threats. But after all, Egypt is such a country which has uh, significant military capabilities, yet they are very much concerned, like your friend said at the beginning, with the military capabilities of primarily Israel, because Israel, even though it's not, uh, uh, it has never acknowledged nor ever denied the presence of nuclear weapons, it is known as, or uh, uh, very uh, seriously believe, uh, as having nuclear weapons capability. And Egypt is very much concerned with that capability. Although, or even though there is peace between Egypt and Israel, Still, when we talk uh, to Egyptian people or when you just sit around the table together with the Egyptians, Israelis, and other c countries in the Middle East, you see that first and foremost, the, the, the most significant military threat perceived from the region is not necessarily uh, the military capabilities of Iran or Iraq or Syria or Jordan or Saudi Arabia, but primarily the military capabilities of Israel, which pose uh, the greatest challenge in the meter domain to, to uh, Egypt. I mean, uh, this may sound weird, this may sound a little bit strange, because it is the first and now uh, one of two states which uh, have uh, signed a peace treaty with Israel, which have of officially formally recognized the state of Israel. And one might think, or one would think, that Israel would not make the, uh, sorry, Egypt would not make the Israeli military capabilities so big an issue, but it is. It is uh, primarily the, the most important uh, military threat perceived uh, from the region uh, by the Egyptian scholars and, and security analysts, diplomats, military people, because Israel has not only uh, nuclear weapons, as most people believe, and uh, also believed to have chemical and biological weapons. I mean, we, we don't have any accurate or specific information about their presence, but this is what most countries in the region, including the Egyptians, believe uh, to be as such. I mean, Egyptian threat perception is very much centered around the weapons of mass destruction capabilities of Israel. So, of course, uh, we'll talk about the peace process separately. It's not something, it is, uh, in some respects, at the very core of everything with respect to the Middle East. Because whomever you have a chance to talk about the, the security situation in the Middle East, the political situation in the Middle East, or anything about the Middle East, the future of the Middle East, or the past of the Middle East, it all comes down to the, uh, the Arab-Israel conflict and the Palestinian problem. Whether it is true or not for some countries, such as Iran, which you might think may not have much to do with the Palestine issue because after all, when you go to the historical records, Iran is not much of a party to the dispute. But especially since the Islamic Revolution, we see Iran is becoming one of the players because of its connection with uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, and also uh, Palestinians in Jordan and also the, the Shia uh, in, in the Gulf area. So, and Palestinians have also, because they were in a dire need of anything, any support that they could mobilize, and therefore they, they not fully maybe, but uh, in some respect became appreciative of the support that they received for, from Iran. But um, here, uh, the, the, uh, the peace process is at the very core of everything. Without achieving any results, many people believe whatever solution may be found to any particular problem here, I mean the armament, disarmament, or proliferation, non-proliferation, it may not be a lasting solution unless the Palestine problem is fully resolved. Yes, we can understand it. I mean the Palestine problem, it's 
I mean, it, it is this, this region, it's all Palestine in the past during the Ottoman period, and the, there are a number of headings, a number of issues, major issues, and there, there are subheadings. And these, these issues are so intertwined, so mixed uh, uh, with one another, so therefore very difficult to solve. I mean, the, uh, the, the status of East Jerusalem, for instance, which is proclaimed uh, to be the uh, capital of Israel since the early 1980s, not uh, recognized by every state, including Turkey, but at least uh, uh, some have moved their uh, embassies, some countries have moved their embassies from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I mean, this is one issue because East Jerusalem is also claimed to be the capital of Palestinian states, state whenever it is uh, fully created, which is not acceptable to Israelis. There is the status of the Palestinian uh, people who live in so-called temporary camps for so many years, for decades, literally, and uh, also live in Jordan, Lebanon, and elsewhere, and also in some other countries in the Gulf. And the, the right to return to Israel, which is again something not uh, most possibly uh, acceptable for Israel, not only for economic reasons, because there will be so many people coming, uh, not necessarily with any skills for, with, uh, who, who can uh, employ the ranks of uh, certain uh, jobs, but also the demographic, the, the Jewishness of the Israeli state will be, uh, of course, uh, challenge, something not acceptable. There is also uh, in the uh, situation about um, the security, I mean, whether there is going to be a military uh, uh, capability of the Palest Palestinian state. So these are all at the very uh, core of all problems. But since there is uh, no sort of uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel for the time being, I mean, since there is no such a uh, good prospects for any uh, or full-fledged resolution of conflict in the region, this doesn't mean that all other problems will, be, will have to be postponed to a later date to discuss. And therefore, uh, armament or the, the, the weapons proliferation in the region has always been discussed. I mean, um, how to take some other steps in the other areas which may help building confidence between Arabs and the Israelis, which may pave the way to a fuller, to a better solution between uh, uh, sort of the uh, greater region, uh, between the parties, including uh, all other countries in the region, which may ultimately lead to an eternal peace. Well, uh, difficult, but the situation with respect to weapons proliferation is one of them. And what most countries expect from other countries in the region is that uh, these, the existing weapons uh, or non-proliferation agreements or disarmament treaties must be signed and also ratified by all the members uh, or all the countries in the region, which is not necessarily the case. There are several treaties, there are several conventions which some of the parties have signed up only have, and they have not gone uh, and, and they have not ratified. Some have not even signed or ratified. Or some have signed, ratified, but not necessarily uh, comply with the requirements of that particular convention and have been found as cheating, as was the case with Iraq. Remember, Iraq was uh, a state party to the non-proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, three on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, the MPT, prevents any country other than the five uh, legally acknowledged nuclear weapon states that I mentioned briefly last time. All other countries must uh, not have any, even the intention to deviate uh, their, or the, the divert their military, uh, cap uh, peaceful capabilities or civilian capabilities from peaceful applications in the nuclear air uh, field to military applications. And Iraq was found as having done some clandestine, some, some uh, hidden secret uh, uh, occupation. 
uh, engagement with nuclear weapons uh, procurement or nuclear weapons development in the past. So these are uh, issues that have to be dealt with uh, by all the countries in the region. I mean, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, all of them are concerned with weapons proliferation. All of them are concerned with chemical and biological weapons proliferation. All of them are concerned with nuclear weapons proliferation. And these are weapons of mass destruction. And we have discussed as to why they were called conventional and unconventional. Because if and when they are used, the, uh, the effects of unconventional weapons may go beyond the intentions of the users, I mean, the military commanders or the polit political decision makers. But there are also other weapons, the conventional arms, I mean, uh, artilleries, tanks, rockets, missiles, or naval assets, I mean, uh, naval vessels, etc. And these are equally a uh, source of concern for some countries, especially Israel. For instance, when Egypt wants to talk about the nuclear weapons in the region or chemical biological weapons in the region, and there is this uh, you know, proposal put forward before the international community, uh, community by Egypt, both in the past and uh, more recently, as I will talk about um, just in a moment. But Israel keeps saying, all right, let's talk about chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, but also let's talk about the Katyusha rockets or improvised uh, um, uh, explosive devices, IEDs. I mean, because the uh, suicide bombers may just, just like the case uh, that a couple of days ago in Istanbul, I mean, someone can explode himself, blow himself up, and by killing others. Hopefully this time that was not the case, but many people were injured. But in the past, we have seen on a number of occasions, uh, in, uh, a number of suicide bombers have blown themselves up together with Israeli citizens. So these are of greater concern to the Israeli decision makers because these are direct threats to their uh, citizens. <coughs> And, and the rockets that are uh, uh, launched from uh, some uh, southern Lebanon or some other parts here, maybe in southern Syria or maybe in some posts uh, in, in Jordanian territory, which may not be under fully control of the state uh, officials. So these have always been uh, of greater concern for the Israelis. So therefore, th there is a, this kind of mixed set of uh, issues all of which, when combined together, make a big uh, universal set of issues that may s sound like uh, almost uh, hopeless in terms of finding a solution. Because, um, as I said, on the one hand, there is this um, and also conventional. I mean, you can fill in any uh, weapon system here. So when it comes to the MPT, there is only one country in the region which has not signed or ratified a treaty, which is Israel. So the Israeli uh, threat perception required them to not become a party to the MPT. They have signed but not ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention. And as far as I remember, they have not even signed Biological Weapons Convention. When it comes to Egypt, for instance, Egypt has been one of the proponents of the Nuclear Weapons uh, uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty and has not only signed, but also in 1974, together with Iran, proposed the creation of a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. In 1974, Israel proposed, I mean, uh, sorry, Iran and uh, Egypt have jointly brought before the United Nations General Assembly a proposal to create a zone free of nuclear weapons in the Middle East, which was actually adopted after several times. At the beginning, was welcomed by the international community, and then after some time, it was adopted even without a vote because everybody agreed upon the necessity of creating a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East. Meaning, 
in anywhere, uh, nowhere in the Middle Eastern uh, territory would there be any nuclear weapons. Even Israel did not object to it. Well, they probably did not object to this proposal after having expressed some concerns at the beginning and then they dropped even their concern because they have not officially acknowledged their weapons capability. So there is nothing to be concerned, at least uh, on paper, formally. I mean, and, and the second and maybe more important reason was because they have seen, almost seen, the impossibility of reaching such a deal or uh, uh, creating such a zone because when it comes to the uh, acceptance, everybody says, all right, uh, creating a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East will be a great idea. I, I, I'm going to sign, sign up for this. I'm going to accept it, but provided there is such and such other steps are taken by such and such states. For instance, I mean, uh, yes, Egypt uh, uh, and, and Iran, and when I say this is in 1974, and the Shah is in power in Iran. It's not the Islamic Republic of Iran today. But still, the Islamic Republic of Iran has not changed the Shah's policy to endorse the idea of creating a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. Because once you create a nuclear weapon free zone, that will prevent any state within this zone which of course becomes a party, which becomes a sort of a member of that zone, there will be no such weapons on their territory, on the territory of any, any country. Of course, the target was first and foremost Israeli nuclear weapons capability. That is, although we don't have any exact record of when Israel may have acquired, if at all, which we believe actually uh, that they had, uh, th th their nuclear weapons capability, there are powerful estimates that this may have taken place sometime around the 67 war. Maybe before, maybe a little later. We don't know. And we understand this from some writings, as we mentioned before, Avner Cohen, who has written extensively on the subject. And uh, he's still writing uh, papers, uh, articles, and also giving conferences, which you can watch on some uh, internet uh, sites. Anyway, so, but one reason was possibly uh, targeting uh, Israeli nuclear weapons capability, that is, uh, proposing such a zone in order to get rid of Israeli nuclear weapons, if, of course, Israel would ever accept it, would ever agree to it. But on the other hand, the timing of Iran's and Egypt's uh, sort of uh, proposal is significant in that. In 1974, which is the post-Yom Kippur period, Yom Kippur War period, which you should remember uh, caused or had a number of consequences, one of which was the OPEC crisis, um, Saudi Arabian embargo on the United States and the Netherlands, and paved the way to the uh, steep increase in the price of oil, three times or four times over, over a short period of time, and Iran, the Shah of Iran, who had uh, prior ambitions already, but because of some economic, political, financial difficulties, was not in such a position to realize its ambitions, um, then embarked upon on a rapid uh, development project in the nuclear field. And once you embark upon uh, in such an ambitious project, Nuclear, uh, nuclear program, then of course you sort of ring certain bells somewhere and you raise concerns in the rest of the world as to whether you have ambitions to build nuclear weapons. And in order to mitigate the fears of the rest of the world, the world community, Iran Shah as an expression of his goodwill that he had no intention whatsoever to build any nuclear bomb which, uh, as I will discuss in the coming weeks when, I, when we will focus on the Iranian nuclear program, to me at least was not so much convincing, yet uh, in order to, to uh, provide assurances to the rest of the world, Iran co-sponsored with Egypt in 1974 a proposal to create a nuclear weapon free zone. So on the one hand, 
you, you sort of start up a large ambitious project uh, uh, for nuclear, uh, for establishing or building nuclear power plants, also bringing nuclear science to the country, and with this uh, ostensibly or uh, at the declaratory level, a peaceful project, over time, in due course, eventually, you may divert from peaceful to military purposes. So that issue came uh, right after Iran uh, sort of had this influx of large sums of uh, revenues coming from oil exports because of the increased oil prices. Then Shah, the Shah of Iran, set on to realize his long uh, ambition, long time ambitions to uh, develop uh, nuclear uh, energy, possibly for, of course, uh, peaceful uses, but also maybe uh, for other types of applications, such as military applications. Anyway, why Egypt was a sort of co-sponsoring country, that's also an important question, because Egypt uh, has always a sort of a, a cared about maintaining a certain parity with the other powers in the region. As we discussed before, there has always been this rivalry among Egypt, Syria, and Iraq as to who would lead the Arab world, who would be the true representative, true spokesperson of the Arab world. As to who, I mean, during the Nasser period, there was no such question, because Nasser was unarguably and undisputedly the leader of the Arab world, at least for the people in, in the Arab streets may not be at the uh, administrative level. People may, might have envied uh, uh, Nasser's uh, position, but yet that was the situation. But still, Egypt, uh, uh, being an important country, seeing itself first and foremost part of the Middle East rather than Africa. Because, of course, Africa features in, on uh, Egypt's foreign policy radar screen quite often, but yet, until recently, when Egypt felt more powerful when compared to the upstream uh, riparians of the Nile River, I mean, the, the territories where Egypt, a sort of Nile was uh, sort of born and f flown all through, Egypt did not care too much about what was going on in African politics. Yes, of course, they paid attention. Yes, of course, they care, but they focused, they, they sort of devoted much of their energy to Middle Eastern politics, to the Arab-Israeli peace process, to Israeli military capabilities. Iran's situation, I mean, because um, Egyptian scholars, military experts, uh, diplomats, um, who feel like they can speak freely about the Egyptian foreign policy issues in uh, sort of roundtable discussions or in private conversations, of course, not secret conversations, but you know, when you have a chance to ask, you can understand that if after, I mean, Egypt is not happy with the situation that Israel has nuclear weapons. But this is something that they believe they cannot change over time, I mean, overnight. And this is going to uh, be a such for the foreseeable future. What concerns Egyptian uh, security elite more than the Israeli nuclear weapons capability is another country becoming nuclear weapons capable state. So, of course, Egypt would like to see Israel with no nuclear weapons. There is no question about it. But this being a situation which is likely to stay with us for 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 civil future, they say. We would not like to see and we cannot tolerate any other country developing nuclear weapons at all. So therefore, Egypt maybe having seen Iran having the potential uh, to develop nuclear weapons in the future because of its sort of a large scale investment in nuclear technology, Egypt might have wanted to control Iran by co-sponsoring a nuclear weapon-free uh, weapon zone in the Middle East. So you see, sometimes uh, agreements, bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements are signed and implemented for the benefit of all the parties, all of them 
to uh, advance their positions. And sometimes th this kind of uh, agreements, treaties, conventions, whatever, are signed in order to control others. Rather than improving your position, you pay more attention to not let others improve their position. So therefore, an, an Egyptian, uh, Iranian co-sponsored nuclear weapon free zone Middle East uh, pr uh, proposal was, of course, at least on paper at the declaratory level, aiming at freeing the entire Middle Eastern region from weapons of mass destruction and primarily from uh, nuclear weapons. But the, the hidden agenda, I believe, this is my interpretation, may or may not be true, which I believe is true, is to control Iran. Because, yes, Israeli capabilities are there, and the, the Egyptians are realistic enough that Israelis will not give up their nuclear weapons any time in the uh, foreseeable future, and that there is this strong backing of the United States. So, from the Egyptian perspective, so at least there is uh, uh, the peace treaty, there is a certain level of uh, understanding, but any other country developing that weapon, nuclear weapons uh, in particular, would be a bigger challenge for uh, at least something that can also uh, challenge the status of Egypt in the region. So um, this issue, this 1974 nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East was taken uh, another step forward in 1990. If I'm not mistaken, it was in September 1990, but I might be wrong, or August or September 1990, which, is, uh, as far as I remember, was a reaction to uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, partly, and also with the, uh, came with the, or in the anticipation of what was coming uh, in the region. And Egyptian diplomats, politicians, took this issue even uh, one step further, and they have sort of proposed, which is known as Mubarak plan. Which aims at creating a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Uh, it's a long acronym here. Zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Actually, Egyptians make this distinction that they have not uh, made a specific uh, proposal under the title of zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. But they actually, the, the Mubarak plan actually uh, proposed as free, f freeing or clearing the region from all weapons of mass destruction. They say when you ask what is the difference between a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East and freeing the Middle East from weapons of mass destruction, they say, well, the term zone may make it complicated because it requires some institutional arrangements, some uh, verification mechanism. So the Mubarak plan, the president of uh, Egypt, uh, I mean, known after his name, the Mubarak plan aims at freeing the Middle East from all weapons of mass destruction. It is not necessarily a zone, and Egyptians underline that uh, uh, emphasize and underscore that they have never officially mentioned the term zone here, which, as I said, uh, would require um, a creation of some institutional frameworks and some verification mechanisms, some documents. Well, of course, freeing the Middle East from all weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, chemical, biological, how realistic it would be to do so without having a zonal arrangement, I mean institutional arrangements, that's another question. And actually, and honestly, I really don't understand as to why the Egyptians want to underline or underscore this tiny difference between a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East and clearing the Middle East from weapons of mass destruction or freeing the Middle East from weapons of mass destruction. I don't know under what sort of uh, uh, considerations they, they make this distinction, but they all, all of them come down to the same issue. Is there any point which, is, which you are lagging behind? Just feel free to ask. I mean, this is important because, I mean, Egypt is not a state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. And again, 
uh, not a party to the Biological Weapons Convention. It is not a state party to the Comprehensive Test Ban, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I mean, this uh, treaty, which has not yet entered into force, because it is uh, entry into force of the uh, CTBT, uh, is uh, pending upon the ratification of 44 states, one of them being Turkey. Uh, and these 44 states are such states in, on whose territory there is small, big or small, one or many nuclear facilities. And Egypt is one of these countries which does not want to sign the CTBT, not even sign or ratify the CTBT. Does not sign the Chemical Weapons Convention, does not sign the Biological Weapons Convention. And when you ask this question as to why you don't do that, and the, the explanation is clear. We want a uh, sort of region-wide arrangement, and if there is a country which has uh, supposedly have nuclear weapons and others you know, are known as having chemical and biological weapons because we have seen during the Iran-Iraq war the use of extensive use of chemical weapons. And Iran may not have used as much as Iraq did and there are many uh, Iranian victims and also uh, uh, veterans of war who still suffer the consequence of uh, extensive usage of uh, chemical weapons by Iraqis. Syria, again, never acknowledges or never officially admits the presence of chemical weapons, but uh, there is uh, a strong suspicion about the Syrian chemical and biological, maybe, weapons capabilities. And therefore, uh, Israel, again, with nuclear weapons and possibly with chemical and biological weapons, we don't know exactly. So all of these issues, when, when combined together, presents a situation that, I mean, the, this, uh, even uh, making the smallest step uh, toward any uh, sort of peaceful resolution of the existing conflicts is uh, very difficult because everyone has almost uh, uh, incompatible a priori or just uh, sine qua non conditions that may not be met even partially by other states to start with. Because, I mean, how can you talk about chemical biological weapons issues with countries when Israeli nuclear capability is there? Uh, and when, even, even, for instance, there was this debate, discussion, I mean, just hypothetical situation, if Israel, which has nuclear deterrent, which uh, presumably doesn't need chemical and biological uh, weapons, having this upper hand in the nuclear field, if Israel did decide to sign chemical and biological weapons, and um, sign a chemical weapons convention and ratify the chemical weapons convention, if Israel did this, would Egypt follow suit together with Syria? No, because Israeli nuclear weapons capability, again, in itself, is a major source of concern. Therefore, uh, issues are not necessarily commensurate. I mean, I mean, if you go and sign and ratify this and that treaty, I will go and sign and ratify the same treaty. No, it doesn't work that way in the Middle East. So therefore, and for instance, on the other hand, if, for instance, um, Egypt and uh, Assyria somehow provides more assurances about the security situation in Israel, would Israel be fully uh, uh, comfortable with this situation? No, because somebody has to pro provide assurances with respect to the situation in the Lebanon and the Palestinian and the Hamas, for instance. I mean, who will control the military capabilities of Hamas? This is another major question in the uh, minds of the Israelis. So all of these issues are mixed. All of these are issues are somehow intertwined. And uh, these are, uh, uh, this is a set of very complex and, of course, not totally insolvable. Anything can be solved, provided that there is commitment uh, on the party, on the side of the decision makers. But 
course, long-term commitment is also necessary because in the, future, in, in the Middle East, it is very difficult to see whether the, the regime with which you make a commitment will survive long enough to honor its commitments in the future too. So this is another problem. But yet, um, this is a huge set of problems, which, of course, uh, I try to give a big picture, the frame. And starting from next week, we will look at uh, uh, particular situations like the situation in Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, Jordan, etc. And we will come more uh, closer to our contemporary uh, sort of developments. Okay, on, um, I'll see you on, on Friday at 9.30.